African Ascent International is truly honored uh, for the first time to give space to a, a conversation uh, which promises to be uh, extraordinary with a nuclear physicist in which uh, my chief work would be uh, to learn uh, from a physicist, uh, an emerging one, who belongs to a long tradition of the giants who have been attempting to give us an interpretation of the universe and the planet within which we live. Uh, considerably younger than most um, nuclear physicists, he is described as a genius in his own right. And uh, with him on board, a theoretical physicist, a saxophonist, uh, who blends two genres into a seamless mastery, would be the guest of African Ascent International uh, this afternoon. I've heard uh, quite a bit um, uh, about this um, nuclear physicist, uh, rather a theoretical physicist, uh, who also uh, could just as easily uh, qualify as nuclear physicist, um, uh, because he's qualified and um, the qualification will uh, speak itself uh, to, to talk to us um, uh, about everything that the universe is. Uh, we're going to learn about its structure, its um, ontology, um, uh, its place and meaning um, in human lives. Um, Alexander Stefano. Alexander is a professor at Brown University who graduated from that same university many years ago. And then that degree led him to uh, have occupied a legion of um, powerful places at prestigious universities. And then uh, he comes back if memory serves me, uh, to become a professor at the university from which he graduated in 2005. Um, he has written numerous articles, but he's particularly known for this uh, jet setting, uh, truly extraordinary and, um, and, uh, and uh, original work on and, and, um, jazz in physics and um, uh, physics in jazz, or popularly uh, titled as jazz and physics. And then um, I'm going to talk to him about the relationship uh, between jazz and uh, physics um, at length. So the first question uh, that I'm going to um, share with uh, uh, Stefano or Alexandro, I wish he allows me to uh, call him by his first name. If he does, um, I'll call him by that name for the next one hour or so. The first question is going to be a question uh, in which I'm going to ask him to respond to the following uh, philosophical proposition, namely this. If it is uh, the, the case uh, that um, the, the, the universe itself is music, and if it is the case uh, that if the universe itself is music, and music itself is vibration, and vibration uh, in turn needs a, a further um, uh, uh, explanation. Uh, the question remains then, uh, what is uh, the, the universe made out of? Is it the case that the universe itself is music? Uh, I'll begin with an examination of that question, and then um, I'll divide it into uh, slices and parts as we move on. And then the second part of the interview is going to be devoted to John Coltrane. Uh, most particularly, uh, unlike uh, most human beings who reflect on Coltrane, who do this through, through giant steps, uh, I'm going to take a radical turn, and I'm going to concentrate on love supreme. That will be the second part of the interview. And the first part is going to be strictly on, uh, on physics, uh, the nature of physics. Take it from there, Professor. Well, thank you so much, Professor, for um, having me here. It's, been, it's an honor. I've been um, following um, your conversations over the years. Um, and so I'm in... Um, it's a humbling task for me to um, try my best to um, address this very difficult question that you pose, actually. The program of um, 
this idea of a musical universe start, some say started with Pythagoras, the idea of music of the spheres. This idea that um, around 500 BC, um, at the birth of what we call Greek philosophy, um, Pythagoras came on the seat and said, hey, you know, the planets are playing, they're playing a harmony in line with the whole integers. But what a lot of us don't, don't know that Pythagoras actually spent, to my knowledge, um, a number of years prior to that at the mystery schools in Egypt. So it seems that this um, connection between music and the universe and reality seems to extend um, actually, <clears throat> and this, I think this is open to research. This is actually a question I want to throw back at you and the audience, which is, if indeed um, there was a link between the pre-Socratics and um, what was going on in Africa, um, in East Africa in particular, um, and some of those ideas found themselves later on in Greece, should we not be asking about the relationship between music and the cosmos in Africa? And um, I think that if I was to write a second book, it would be a research project to explore that question. But if you allow me to continue on, I just throw that out there as a question. Um, that the birth now of what we call modern physics and, um, and modern mathematics, starting from Pythagoras' intuition and then of course Plato and Aristotle, Ptolemy and, and a, a whole bunch, a whole slew of people, that tradition of thinking about the universe as being harmony um, and the relationships of harmony um, really spilled into, into um, our theories, our theories that basically try to express those relationships. So when we think about music, we're thinking about basically a sense of, and I use the word very loosely, of course. I mean, I, because, you know, what's harmony to some is not harmony to others. But it's idea of relationship, of harmony, of holism, of affect, of the idea that music has a profound um, connection on the human soul and the human mind and the human heart. And talking to some neuroscience friends of mine, it seems that music actually in, is the one thing that engages the entire human brain. Um, the entire brain has to be activated to process music. So all this points to this intuition I think a lot of us have that you know, this thing we call music that can move us so deeply. And this thing we call the universe, which is responsible for at least housing us, <laughs> housing planets, housing galaxies, housing, you know, a situation that we could now be in. Um, maybe they're, you know, they're connected in some ways. And that's kind of like what I was exploring in my book. Um, and I would say that um, you know, I would say that the, um, the jury's still out, the jury's still out, but w when we talk about Coltrane later on, um, what we'll see is that there have been a number of, of, of masters in music who also had a similar intuition for other reasons. Okay. Now, uh... Stefan, you wrote eloquently uh, in the jazz of music the following statements, which I really liked. Let me read them. Sound is a vibration that pushes a medium, such as air or something solid to create traveling ways of pressure. Different sounds create different vibrations, which in turn create different pressure waves. We can draw pictures of these waves called waveforms. A key point in the physics of vibrations is that Every wave 
has a measurable wavelength and height. With respect to sound, the wavelength dictates the pitch, high or low, and the height or amplitude describes the volume. This paragraph is eloquent, dense, truly brilliant, but I would like you to take time to develop it slowly and um, as simply as you can, not for the benefit of nuclear physicists and accomplished musicians like you, um, but ordinary individuals like me who, who want to learn from you. Lead me on, teach me, give me a crash course on these statements that you've made about vibrations, about pressure waves, about waveforms. And if you like, if there is time, we can also link this to um, quantum mechanics, uh, quantum gravity. Um, uh, string theory, uh, all in one piece. I have heard you um, giving talks on this and doing it um, truly wonderfully. But I would like you to make maybe a little more effort to translate it as simply as you can for the ordinary viewer, please. Should I reread it to you uh, in case I have overwhelmed you with the reading? Yeah, we read the last sentence of all of that of that quote. Okay, it's the last sentence. Okay, I could read the whole sentence quickly so that it could um, digest it and then translate it. Sound is a vibration that pushes a medium, such as air or something solid, to create traveling waves of pressure. If you like. I can also save this particular paragraph. And then when we do call train, I was going to ask you to apply these steps to the facts, to the instrument that you play, so that we can have a visual image of this medium, um, the solid air, um, the waves, the pressures, and so on, if you like. But I thought first we should do the physics, and then we'll apply this to the music when we are, uh, analyze Coltrane, if you agree. If you give me the last, read the last sentence, I'll be very helpful and I'm happy to of do course, that now. Of course, I'll be more than happy to do so. The last sentence is, with respect to sound, with respect to sound, the wavelength dictates the pitch, high or low, and the height or amplitude describes the volume. The paragraph is so powerful. It's full mm. of images. And, and mm. I, I want to learn more about the physics underlying it. I want to learn more about vibrations, about particles, subatomic particles, about strength, um, special theory of relativity, uh, quantum gravity, so forth and so on. Uh, because they are mm. all collected, I think, in this statement, I think. You're correct. You're correct about that. So I think the most important thing is to understand like what is the underlying phenomenon that encapsulates a wide range of things that appear to be different. So the idea of a vibration, let's just talk about a vibration. Yes. What do I mean by a vibration? So I'm going to show you a vibration right now. I'm going to move my hand to the left and the right. All right. The reason why I can claim that this is a vibration is because there's the sense of which my hand is swinging from left to right. It gets to some point and it has to return back. So the, the essence of a vibration is the idea of equilibrium. That there's a fixed point, there's a point, which is where my hand is at right now. If I, just, if I move it here, it wants to come back to the equilibrium. If I go this way, it pulls it, the equilibrium pulls it back. But it ends up going this way because that's equivalent to being up here. So it ends up, the compromise is that it vibrates or it oscillates. The word oscillation or swaying and vibration are the same word. It's a motion, it's a motion 
that basically comp that hovers around the equilibrium point. So the minute you see, if I'm at the equilibrium point, and I do, if I do not disturb my hand. It just stays there, but the minute I change it, then vibration will set in motion and do this because it always wants to be turned back to the equilibrium. But when it gets to the equilibrium, it still has energy. So the notion now of any vibration has two fundamental concepts. One concept is a concept of the equilibrium point, the point that you want to return to. If I move you this way, I have to return back. So if you have a rubber band and you pull a rubber band, it wants to come back to the equilibrium. When I leave it alone, it's right there. If I stretch it and I let it go, or if I have a swing or a pendulum and I, I go up to some height, it wants to come back down to the equilibrium point. The second concept in, in this is, I gotta get away from this slide here. The second concept, is energy. You have equilibrium and energy. The minute I put energy, if a system, if a particle on this hand of mine is at rest in its equilibrium position, and then I give it energy, I apply energy to move it. What happens is that energy, the minute I give this thing energy, where does the energy go? It goes into motion. And if the energy is conserved and doesn't, my energy is conserved, it will stay in motion along this vibration. So good. So sound is an example. A sound wave or a sound vibration is an example of, of this more general feature, which is that if I have a system, a physical system in equilibrium, and I displace it from equilibrium, it will undergo vibration because energy is conserved. Energy can't go anywhere else. It'll just continue along that motion about the equilibrium. Now, obviously, in reality, what ends up happening is that it slowly comes back down to a halt because that energy gets transformed into sound, into other form, heat and all these things, and it dissipates away. But in an ideal universe, the minute something is in some form of vibration. So a planet's going around the sun is another example of a circular motion. And the equilibrium point is the fact that it's at some fixed distance away from the planet. So it vibrates around the planet. And that, that was Pythagoras's intuition that any object in circular motion, it's a vibration. Okay. So, um, the, so the essence of what I'm going at here is that any mechanical system, any system that can undergo vibration, that can undergo a displacement from the equilibrium, right, it's, uh, it's going to undergo some oscillation, some periodic vibration that's happening over a given period of time, which is basically nothing more than the frequency, how, how frequently it goes back into this equilibrium point is the frequency. How many times I cross this equilibrium point? If I cross it very fast, the frequency is high. If I cross it very low, the frequency is very low. The amount of time it takes right, is long. The wavelength is nothing more than, if you think about it, the length of, if I draw a wave associated with every time I go up and down, I draw up and a down, and up and a down, that's a wave. And therefore, the longer the wavelength is, right, the longer it takes this thing to go from up to down. The shorter the wavelength is, right, the faster it goes up and down, right? So sound waves are examples of, in this case, air molecules vibrating away from the equilibrium due to the action of a vibrating instrument. 
that was remarkable um, and, and, and it, it, it couldn't have been done uh, any better. This is probably one of the best descriptions um, that my ears had ever listened uh, to, 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 to understand the nature of vibrations. Now, um, a companion of uh, interest, uh, what is the relationship between particles and waves? Oh, that's a, that, that one is even. Well, there's a very, very um, complicated answer to that. And then there's a simple one. Okay. How about I try the simple one? So what is a wave? Let me. Think of a wave as something that has some extent, yes. right? It is an undulating pattern, like a water wave. You see water waves. So by definition, a water wave, right? It's not localized anywhere. It's one whole thing, right? It's an extended object. So part of the wave can see When I say a water wave, and I think about water wave, I, I can't just, say, so I can say, Part of the wave is here, and part of it is here. So, for example, if I talk about a water, a, a wave of water, for example, in the ocean, it could be that at some point in time, the wave will be part of the wave. Part of the wave will be here, and part part of the wave will be up. But so I need to, and to talk about the wave. I have to talk about the wave in many different locations. Yes. Right. When I, when I think about a particle, I think about something that is localized, mm -hmm. that, that is located in a given region, a very small region. A tennis ball is here. It's not extended in some big, like a wave. So in a lot of ways, when we think about a wave conceptually and a particle, they seem to have opposing characteristics. Indeed. A particle is actually, in, in quantum physics and particle physics, these things are very... They're almost point-like entities. Yes. Extended for something like a quark is at the order of 10 to the minus, you know, trillions of a centimeter. And, and this is a point down to that point. Whereas a wave can be like very extended. One wave and one particle are opposites in terms of its, its location. A particle is very localized and a wave is delocalized. So how could a particle be a wave and a wave be a particle? Well, that's the foundation of quantum mechanics. I mean, was that bold claim from De Boyle, um, the French um, physicist, and Einstein, and all, uh, Niels Bohr, and all, Heisenberg, all of them was pointed to this idea that actually they're dual to each other. They're complementary to each other. Dif different, different sides to the same coin almost. A quantum particle is a coin, but one aspect of this quantum entity is that it's a wave, and the other entity of it is that it's a particle. It's not neither or, it's both. I see. And so how could it be? Well, one way to conceptualize this is in the following way. See, in quantum mechanics, what is quantized? What do we mean by quanta? And what we mean by quanta is that things like energy are not smooth and continuous. Like I have one unit of energy, 1.5, 1.6, I guess I go up and up and up in and energy. In quantum mechanics, the energy is, goes and jumps. One unit of energy. Two, three. There's no one point. There's no in between. It leaps like a step. There's nothing in between energy. Well, in quantum phenomena, vibrations that are quantized cannot be like smooth. They have to be like notes, actually, I see. like from C to D, right? So, so in other words, in quantum mechanics, the way we make energy quantized or discrete is to make the frequency of my wave exists in only in discrete units. You understand that? So I can have one unit of frequency and two units of the same of frequency for a given wave, but it cannot oscillate anywhere in between. It can only oscillate one way or another way, but no in between. If I want to transform 
from one form of energy to another form of energy. I need to transform in a digital way in terms of the frequency. And so the catch here is that that digital wave is a particle of the wave. I see. Mm -hmm. Let me continue even more, um, because you're so extraordinary at this. You must be um, a great teacher at Brown. I can't wait until I sit um, in one of your courses. You've taught. I'm just very. I'm just very. I'm, I'm a simple-minded physicist. And on the contrary, I have seen you giving some incredibly. Uh, complicated interpretations in TED Talks and uh, uh, numerous places, in fact. But uh, today, I decided to take you in the other direction, and I'm enjoying it tremendously. And so let me continue digging, uh, digging even deeper. And the next question might upset you, but knowing you, I think you're going to handle me. You're not going to be upset. It's going to be an obtuse question. It's a philosophical question. The question is this. If waves are partly uh, particles, is it possible for us to think that particles are conscious? Do they have consciousness at all? Or is it the observer who attributes the meaning of their behavior? Or is it possible for the, for the waves and for the particles? to be conscious that they are being observed? That's a very, um, I think that's a cutting edge question. I mean, that's kind of where research is at these days in terms of fundamental physics and how fundamental physics is being not forced, but at least invited to engage with modern neuroscience and philosophy and metaphysics, you know, um, that branch of philosophy. And you do so well, so, the, because of uh, analogical uh, thinking, what I have learned, sorry for interrupting you, is that mm -hmm. you've done your work, you're interested in philosophy, you're interested in physics, naturally, because that's your craft. You're interested in music, that is also your craft. And additionally, what is impressive about you is that you're also interested in philosophical propositions, such as discussions of consciousness, you are participating in what neuroscientists are beginning to call the hard problem of consciousness. So the descriptions of the behavior of particles and weights that you've given me in, in, in physical terms is remarkable. And my question um, at the expense of upsetting is to go uh, probably a bit deeper into an underlying question, namely, is it you, the observer, the, 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 the theoretical physicist, who is attributing these behaviors to particles or waves, or are particles and waves themselves perhaps so conscious that they may be conscious also that they are being observed? Uh, in which case, then, they could manipulate the observer. Oh, that's a good question. Um, well, I would say that you know, I believe in, I mean, I believe, but I think if you were to push me against a corner, I'm a, I know that there are different words for this, but uh, I, I think now the popular word is panpsychism. The idea that with every bit of matter comes um, a fundamental um, quality of an internal, um, of an internal um, experience consistent with the existence of the thing itself. So in exactly. other words, right. And so I can say that a tiny little electron, the fact that it exists and it has this unit of electric charge and unit of mass, not unit, but, but it has these irreducible physical quantities that you cannot reduce it to something else. That what, what people in panpsychism are saying now, people like David Chalmers, a friend of mine, are saying is that we should also give an irreducible unit of consciousness consistent with the electron. And I think that that's really interesting. I think that, um, you know, humans, we have, we're made up of quadrillions of um, electrons. And so, with, and it organizes, the matter organizes itself in a, in a way where I think consistent with that philosophy, we have, a, you know, we have, um, I think what's interesting is that the idea of panpsychism seen this way in terms of like physical reductionism is consistent with also the idea of that consciousness could also be an emergent property, an epiphenomenon, because all it's saying now is that, you know, um, beings of our form 
our level or our degree of consciousness, you know, represents the complexity of yes. these units with panpsychism. And you could also have an emergent and different states, different levels of consciousness, although each one of them have their own qualia. I don't know what it feels like to be an electron, but all the electrons come together in my brain and all that stuff to create my consciousness. And I think now where things got interesting to me, is going back to your question, is that, okay, if an electron could be conscious in its own unit of consciousness, um, and it's you know, consistent with this idea of panpsychism, and I am observing or I am watching this electron or doing an experiment, who, who is riding which market magic carpet? Precisely. Who is uh, observing home? <laughs> yeah. And I think now the question of, of, now of agency comes into mind. Indeed. I, I, I would say that, you know, I, have, I may have more agency because my level of consciousness is that much more complex than the electron's level of consciousness that I can manipulate to some degree the physical world to impact this electron in ways that it cannot at least to my knowledge. Um, so I think like this idea lends itself to um, this question to many interesting outcomes to test this idea of how panpsychism comes into, into play with things like, um, you know, um, 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 I think Tonini and um, his collaborators um, integrated information that these modern versions of panpsychism that I'm, I'm, you know, I am a fan of, but I think there's a lot to be discovered, a lot to be explored there. Mm -hmm. So what you ask is a very difficult question. Well, I thank you. And um, um, who, is you, the ox, who is the ox and who is the cart? Precisely. Uh, the one who thinks is observing uh, with an incomplete capacity to observe because the instrument with which he or she is observing is the brain. And the brain, as we have learned from these unbelievable conversations between David Baum and Krishna Murti, is by definition inherently limited. And in that the phenomena that it is observing in your language, um, the consciousness that underlies it, is so huge and not totally explained and in that the conclusions that we draw with limited brain capacities that we have uh, cannot possibly reduce phenomena that we don't understand as Dennett and others think into a physical state. That states of consciousness, mental states cannot conceivably uh, be physical states. In fact, uh, physical states, it's up here, uh, could one day be explained by mental states once we understand the nature of consciousness. Hey, um, I, I vibe with you in that same. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, now I want us to move. I'm, I'm, I'm so satisfied with what you've given me. And I feel um, slightly more intelligent than um, I did when I first began, because thanks to you now, uh, I could speak about physical terms. Well. Well, you sound like a you sound like a true philosopher. Well, I try my best, hardly. <laughs> now, I want to move to the second exhilarating part of the uh, of our conversation, namely music, and I'm going to do this with your patience in the following way. Be patient with me; I'll surprise you. I'm going to begin with a poem, the famous poem by Coltrane. If you right, have. okay. I'll do, I'll do all I can to be worthy of thee, O oh Lord. It all has to do with it. Thank you, God. God is all. Help us to resolve our fears and weaknesses. In you, all things are possible. Thank you, God. We know. God made us so. Keep your eye on God. God is. He always was. He always will be. No matter what, it is God. He's gracious and merciful. It's most important that I know the words, sound, speech, man, memory, thoughts, fears, and emotions, time, all related 
all made from one, all made in one. Blessed be his name. Thought waves, thought waves, heat waves, heat waves, all vibrations, all vibrations, all paths lead to God. Thank you, God. His way, it is so lovely. It is gracious. It is merciful. Thank you, God, God. Thank you, God. Have no fear, believe. Thank you, God. The universe has many wonders. God is all. His way, it is so wonderful. Thoughts, deeds, vibrations. Thoughts, deeds, vibrations. Thoughts, deeds, vibrations. All go back to God. And he cleanses all. He is gracious and merciful. Maybe I'll be acceptable in thy sight. We are all one in his grace. The fact that we do not exist is acknowledgement of thee, O oh Lord. Thank you, God. God will wash away all our tears. He always has. He always will. Seek him every day in all ways. Seek God every day. Let us sing all songs to God, to whom all praise is due. Praise God. No road is an easy one, but they all go back to God. I'll go back to the key phrases that I would like you to interpret with the resources of physics as you did for the last 35 minutes and now harmonize them with the resources of music because Coltrane was both interested in physics, his hero was Einstein. Yes. Correct? Yes. No. Correct. All right. So, bless be his name. Thought waves, heat waves, all vibrations, all paths lead to God. Thank you, God. Your comments. If you like, well, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when when I, you know, when I hear the word, I mean, I've had an interesting relationship with that word. I mean, I come from a very um, um, Pentecostal religious family. My grandfather was on one side of family was a a, a preacher man in Trinidad, and my grandmother was a high priestess in the Shango tradition, the spiritual Baptist tradition. My mother is basically a saint, you know, emergency room nurse. Come from a family where this very deep belief in God um, and some of the religiosity associated with God was very much part of my upbringing. Um, my, on the other side of my family, my great grandfather was an imam um, in Trinidad um, from southern India immigrate to Trinidad. I see. So again, this is all, yeah, so this is all interesting. And I became an atheist at age, age nine because I saw, I was saying, God is all this great stuff, you know, God, you know, God is all forgiven, he's grace and, and, um, and then I saw all this bad stuff going on around me in the Bronx where I grew up. I mean, I grew up in, in a neighborhood in the Bronx in the 80s. Um, I was like, well, how could there be a God if all this stuff is going on? God doesn't like us, and he likes the white man. You know, it's like I remember as a nine-year-old kid, I used to have these thoughts, right? Because um, it was very naive, obviously. And I went to the preacher, and I said, if there's a God, then why oh, there's all this suffering in the world? And he gives us all this answer. So again, when I hear this, I hear it also in my own context. And my relationship, after all these years of being a physicist, thinking that I was going to find the answer by going to the most fundamental, finding the subject where I can probe the fundamental questions about reality, quantum gravity, string theory, and I still work on this stuff, and I still am challenged by it, and, I, and it pays the bills, and I can, all that stuff. I have a profession, 
and a livelihood where I can do that. You know, it's interesting that my, I've lost, I've lost my um, fundamental push to know it all in business because I realized that I've come to a place where exactly, it's interesting that, that quote, where I at least can accept or have accepted that while we, can, we will always continue to make advances in science and know things, that is a complete life. How, as Albert Einstein said, the most mysterious things about the universe, one of the most mysterious things, is that we could come to know the universe. That's the most mysterious thing. Not that I've unveiled a mystery, but the fact that I can do that with this limited mind. But I've also come to a place to understand that there are just some things that the human mind will never be able to comprehend. There is a limitation inherent in the very makeup that we are part of the painting. We can't know the painter. So I, that's definitely where I live these days. And I call that God. I call that which we cannot ever comprehend or even imagine, or as imaginative as we are. And even project, because you know, even when we have ideas of God, that's still a projection, that is not God. I am not that, all right? So I think train is coming from that place. Train has tapped into something um, to understand that this, that God is something so way beyond. Um, and I love Supreme. I also, when I hear I love Supreme, also taps into an expression yes. of that divine energy through his improvisation. And that's why it still, you know, is by far my favorite piece of music. Mm -hmm. So, um, um... When you, when you play the sax, uh, first this, why the sax? Why that particular instrument? What is it about the sax that interested you as a physicist? It could be I think the way, you know, right? I think the way the, the, the instrument looked, I remember when I saw it for the first time as an eight-year-old kid, it yes. just looks so intricate. Mm -hmm. It's an intricate looking thing with like it's a device that is then when you hear someone play it, all of a sudden the sound comes out of it. That's very unique. Now don't get me wrong, I've I've come to appreciate and have a love affair with other instruments um as well. But at least there's something about it was it felt like it appealed to me as a physicist. Mm -hmm. Without all these contraptions and and also the saxophone, as when I started playing it, had a personal. You know, it, it also was an instrument, especially the tenor sax, where your own embouchure, your own build, makeup, and all these other factors that went into the sound. Like one of my favorite albums is called Coltrane Sound. Mm -hmm. Just a notion of how the word sound is used in in the music, right? So that one can actually two musicians could have exactly the same instrument and they both play it and they both sound different. And that one can actually maybe work and there's a, that to find one's own voice and one's own sound. And that this instrument lends itself to that possibility was um, something I found interesting, um, uh, attractive. Okay, let me return as I promised you structurally to that beautifully written paragraph that you dissected. You're particularly interested in, 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 in the last four sentences, which are very musical. I want to return to that. And at the expense of belaboring this, uh, be very patient with me. Um, I want you to help me to uh, visualize how this particular um, uh, paragraph um, um, gives me an understanding of what the sax does. Sound sure. is a vibration that pushes a medium, such as air or something solid, to create traveling waves of pressure. Different sounds create, as you were just saying, different vibrations, which in turn create different pressure waves. As I'm reading this, um, Alexander, 
Um, uh, I'm yes. encouraged to think about strings. In one of the reviews that was done of your work, there is an image of strings. I want to visualize how the saxophone processes its relationship with air. First, it's in air. And secondly, it's breathing air, or rather, the player is breathing air and through it now. The air is, anyway, um, who am I to speak this way to? <laughs> how daring a theoretical physicist. Help me um, to see how we can apply what you've said here to what the saxophone does and why you probably chose it. The, like all instruments, the saxophone, um, when energy is put into it to sort of cre create the vibrations of air molecules to create wave-like patterns within the instrument, the instrument itself vibrates along or resonates. It picks up the energy from those vibrations and the instrument itself vibrates. And that then in turn, radiates away just like how if i throw a stone in the pond and waves emanate out throw a stone in the pond what do you see you see waves moving outward right yes those an instrument pond. yes yeah an instrument does that mm. with the sound wave you generate in it it vibrates and it leaves but the wave pattern that's coming out the wave pattern of the pressure what is pressure force the fact that the material form is moving is, right, it's force being applied now to the, and interacting with the air molecules, and those air molecules start moving out, those air waves. So you have waves being transmitted from one form, the form of the metallic instrument, and its vibration starts interacting with the air molecules, and like that stone in the pond, it starts moving. But the pattern of the, of the air, of the waves, become more complex. They become more complicated to reflect the material makeup of an instrument, the geometry of the instrument, all the information about the instrument and who is playing the instrument. That information is contained in the wave patterns that are emanating from the instrument. That is incredible. It, um, um, these responses, um, if I may, may put my career um, uh, in danger, silences uh, some of the reviewers of your works, um, uh, which I read, uh, who thought uh, that uh, you did not succeed to make a case for physics or a case for music. I totally and completely disagree. I think you've convinced me, as a matter of fact, and I'm sure that my viewers are also, that you have made a case, um, as a matter of fact, for the relationship between physics and music. Now, uh, my last two questions, if, uh, if we have time, are going to be the following. The first, if you have time, I don't want to exhaust you. Uh, I would like you to give me a very simple description of that gift, uh, the 1961 gift that Coltrane uh, gave to Latif, uh, whose position you were, um, uh, you were interested um, in having at that cafe one day when you were uh, encouraged to give him a call and he pretended not to be there. Then the moment you said, I could explain the meaning of that circle, then suddenly he became present and then a, a long brilliant relationship begins between you and him. Uh, would, it be, would it be possible for you to give us a crash course on that, on that gift? Sure. So I believe the year was 1961 um, where John Coltrane, so John Coltrane and Yusuf Fatih were very close um, for very good reasons. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, you know, and um, and and there was a Detroit connection as well to that story that I, I don't have time to go into. But anyway, um, you know, um, Yusuf Tartif has his book on all these scales um, that I once had um, access to. And I opened a book up and I was trying to find text to read. 
about the various scales, Egyptian scale, all, all these different interesting scales and patterns for jazz. Um, and um, I also the thing I, I found very fascinating about that was that, you know, he covered everything from bebop to, you know, to Arabic music. So, you know, I mean, it was like a real um, expansive vocabulary um, of the music. And I was fascinated by his book. And I saw at the very beginning of the book, there was a diagram. And maybe you'll be able to share that diagram with the, with the viewers. But this diagram, when I looked at this diagram, I was blown away because at that time I was at Stanford University doing my postdoc working on some mathematical problems and issues having to do with the unification with quantum mechanics and, and Einstein's theory of relativity. And the diagram I saw had same, some of the same geometric forms in it. And I saw it said, birthday present from John Coltrane to Yusuf Latif. Mm -hmm. It was Coltrane's diagram. And I was blown away. I, I felt finally, first time in my life, vindicated that I wasn't that crazy, that Coltrane, too, was a physics nerd. And that he wasn't just simply blowing his horn, but he was like a scientist exploring new systems, new possibilities with his music and with his instrument and with his knowledge of music. He wanted to go into this other territory. So I told Yusuf Latif this. And we had a very long conversation for like three hours. And, you know, one day I, I, I'm going to write about that. But I, I rather it's a, it's a very intricate and long conversation. But let's say it vindicated. And it convinced me that musicians and philosophers like John Coltrane and Yusuf Latif were just on another level. They weren't playing music to just simply entertain people or to be the baddest sax player or what have you. They were... They were like a scientist, like Einstein, seeking new structures, new connections that even transcended the very thing that we categorize and call music. Incredible. Thanks to you, for example. Uh, as you know, I teach at Berkeley College of Music, and thanks to my students, um, I'm increasingly uh, learning um, a few things um, about music. And uh, thanks to you now, uh, for example, you blew my mind away when he informed me that um, Einstein took his breaks during the times that he was playing the violin. Uh, he wasn't merely relaxing, I don't think. You've convinced me that the theory of relativity, as a matter of fact, was being informed and sliced by the vibrations that he was um, um, observing in the instrument that he was playing, from which he was gleaning what Coltrane in Love Supreme is calling these airwaves, these uh, heat, heat waves, these uh, photographs waves so that he could understand the musicality of the universe uh, because what is intriguing you have argued uh, is that the universe itself is music because the universe yes. is made out of vibrations and vibrations as I have learned from you in the form of sounds are the language of music which means that the universe itself is stylized after the structure of vibrations yeah, well, I mean, if we use a word in that general sense of that, it's music that goes beyond our, you know, our perception of sound, that, that what our music, what we listen to, is a sonic allusion to what's going on in the, the, large, in the larger scale in terms of the universe. And when we look at the laws and the way the laws of nature function, it really is based on vibrations and the interactions of vibration. And sound and the music that we as humans call music with the lowercase m, is really a subset of music with capital M. It is remarkable too, I'm sure you know this, uh, because you're quite well versed about Kemet and how Kemet informed uh, Pythagoras and how Pythagoras uh, crafted what he learned in Kemet uh, and then uh, honed it, uh, developed it, appropriated it and uh, uh, made it Greek. Uh, there is a similar move, um, Alexander, in, in, in Indian philosophy in which there is a reference to the transcendent, to the supreme itself being music. Oh, that. interesting. It's, it's, right. You're right. talking about not a Brahma. Right. Exactly. The Brahman itself is music.
the supreme I, it's put that way the supreme is music and this is not merely a metaphor i think it's much more than that it is precisely i think what coltrane is hinting at if not in giant steps at least in love supreme that the uh, consciousness itself and the creator of this consciousness is music and in that the the the, the structure of the universe that the theoretical physicists uh, such as you uh, is coming to understand is itself guided by this uh, the music beyond the music the music of the creator something to that effect well i resonate with I'm that I'm willing I, I, to I, re I, it. I, res I resonate with that all right and finally then this is only part one you're going to uh, with your permission i would like you to become one of the pillars of afghan ascent international so that you could come once a year and give us a report uh, on the state of the art as you are struggling uh, to harmonize and um, physics and music if you like unless you are very tired i would like to end this interview with you making the final case for the jazz in physics well i mean i think that um for me writing the book um the jazz of physics is really a paying homage to my heroes albert einstein john coltrane and just realizing that my journey as you know a jazz musician and as a physicist which was you know, I felt like, you know, at least in my own little mind that society was pulling me in one way or the other. But when I learned more about Coltrane and Einstein, I realized that, that there was no conflict, that these two worlds can coexist. And so the book really was a celebration of my two heroes, John Coltrane and Albert Einstein. It's as simple and plain as that. It's very and, my, and, my, and my other teachers, yeah. And of course, I can't, uh, I would like to end this conversation with only the beginning of a friendship uh, and pay homage uh, to your teacher, Mr. Kaplan, who gave us the physicist. Because he Thank you very much, yes. Very early on, what your potentials were with a simple question on a ball to which he gave a potentially sophisticated answer that took a theoretical physicist to develop. I'm thankful to Mr. Kaplan for giving us Stefano Alexander, one of the heroes of theoretical physics. Thanks for coming to Afghanistan International.